Um, let's see. So on this GitHub repository page, I've included the files that we'll be talking about. If you scroll down the README, you'll see two links that will launch you into an environment where you can interact with the Bash shell. Um, for those of you who joined the first workshop, this will be the same process that we did before. Um, the first one will launch you into a Jupyter Hub that's maintained here at UCLA. Um, and it will require you to use UCLA authentication um, either by choosing uh, the two-factor authentication with UCLA or you can use your Google authentication, but you do have to be careful to use your g.ucla.edu email address if you choose Google. Um, for those of you who don't wanna use this, so for some reason, if this link doesn't quite work the way you expect it to, I have included a second one here. Um, you can click on the launch binder button and this will launch you into a very similar environment. Um, and it won't require authentication. Um, so I'm, I'm going to click on the first one. Um, after authenticating, you you'll, might see a, briefly a, a blue bar that's scrolling across as um, the files get cloned into your environment. And then you'll be launched into something that looks like this. Um, so uh, this is the Jupyter Lab environment. This is hosted um, on the cloud. And when you log in, you're going to be um, inside of your own isolated container. You can think of it like your own little personal computer that's hosted on the cloud uh, with a Linux operating system that you're interacting with. Um, you should also see um, your file hierarchy here on the left. Um, for those of you who haven't log logged into this Jupyter Hub before, you might only see this first folder. Um, if you logged in before, you might have other files here. Um, the particular folder we'll be interacting with is called IDRI Intro to Shell Scripting. Um, and so I'd uh, like you to double click on that just so that we navigate into the folder here on the left that has the files I've made available in the repository. And then, um, there are just a couple more things that we need to do as far as setup. Um, the first thing we want to do is we want to launch a terminal, which will allow us to interact with the shell. Um, so scroll down to the bottom of this launcher tab and click on terminal. And when you click on terminal, it will open up um, a terminal environment uh, with a blinking cursor where you can type commands. So for example, at I'm just typing type commands. Um, the second thing we'll want to do, um, we're going to jump right into things and just start doing our um, shell scripting right away. So um, the next bit of setup that I want to do is um, click on the plus button here. Clicking on the plus button will open up another launcher. And when you get the launcher again, open up a text file. So text file is the button right next to terminal. When you click on text file, it should um, change this into something called untitled.txt. Um, so right now you can see here on the left, um, it's also created this particular file inside of the directory where we are. Uh, we're gonna uh, type commands into this to make this a shell script. So um, I don't necessarily want it to be called untitled.txt, although you could leave it named like this if you really wanted to. We're going to change the name, and to change the name, we can come up to the file menu. And then you scroll down, there's an option to rename text. And um, when you click on that, you'll get a little window prompt. You can name this anything you want. Um, just be sure to keep track of what the title is. Um, I'm just going to call it my script. Um, dot sh um, and dot sh is a common suffix for shell scripts. Um, and then I click on rename and then the title here in the window changes to the new file name. And you can see here on the left, the untitled dot text disappeared and you get my script dot sh. And then as, as the final bit of setup before we get rolling, I'm, you can show um, multiple windows together here in this Jupyter Lab environment. So if, if you 
move your mouse up to the myscript.sh name, um, click down your mouse and hold it down and then move this. You can you see this little blue highlighted area. Um, I'm gonna drag mine to the bottom so that I can visualize um, I can visualize both the shell script that I'm writing as well as the bash shell in which I'm typing the commands. Um, so that's the end of the setup that I wanna do for the moment. Uh, and I'm gonna pause here and um, ask if anybody has any questions about getting set up before we start rolling. Can you show how you dragged those windows um, to be stacked vertically like that one more time? Sure. So I, I move my mouse just over the tab here. I hold the mouse down and, and then I drag the mouse around and it drags it to different parts of the window. And then I just um, let up the mouse button to, to drop it into place. Got it. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right, I'm gonna assume everybody else is set up then. <clears throat> so, um, let me get rid of the type commands here. So just to reorient you with a couple of the basic commands that we covered last time. Um, if I type pwd and hit enter, this will print my working directory. So when, when you're on this system, your username is Jovian um, and the home directory for the for your user here on this system is um, slash home slash Jovian. The slash by itself is your root directory. Inside of the root directory, you have the home directory. And then inside of that, you have your, your user directory. So this is your home directory, um, home Jovian. And if I type ls, this lists the contents um, of my home directory. So this is where the files from the repository have been cloned. Um, we want to navigate into this particular directory that we've found. So CD allows us to change directory. And then you can type the name of the directory. It's a long directory name, so you can use tab completion if you want. Just start typing the first couple letters, for example, IDRE, and then hit the tab key, and that will uh, autocomplete the directory name. And then I hit enter. And you can see here in the prompt, it tells us which directory we're in. So the, the tilde is a shortcut for your home directory. And then inside of your home directory, we have the every intro to shell scripting directory. And if I type ls again, this lists the contents. This lists the same contents that we see here on the left. So there are a number of directories which are um, marked with this folder icon. Um, there are some text files, which is this little um, icon with the folder tab on it. Um, this is a markdown file. This is a Python script. So it has the Python icon. And then the shell script is considered to be like a text file. So it has the same icon as the text files. Um, and just as another example of a simple command, um, echo um, will echo to the output anything that you type after it. So um, I'm gonna echo a, a simple hello world. And I'm gonna put it in quotes so that uh, the shell considers this to be a string, uh, just a string of characters. So when I do echo space and then a string, it will echo this to the output when I hit the enter key. So I hit enter and hello world gets echoed to the, to the screen. Now, the, the idea with the shell scripts is that we can, um, essentially, shell scripts are like collections of commands that you could, if you wanted to, just type at the terminal. Um, you know, but there might be a long sequence of commands that you want to type. Um, you might want to save them for later use. It might be a complicated sequence of commands, which you don't want to have to go through typing all at once at the terminal. So shell scripts are really useful for collecting a group of commands together and then allowing you to execute them all at once. Um, they're also useful for archiving, say, your, your workflow. If, say, you want to um, 
gather your data first with some Linux commands, then you want to execute some programs, and then you want to combine all of the output into a final output product. And that's accomplished with a sequence of different commands. You could write that entire workflow into a shell script so that you could archive it for later use, or you could come back and tweak parts of it without having to mess with all of the rest of the parts before you execute the entire thing. Um, what we're gonna do at the moment is just put the simple echo hello world into our shell script. So I type exactly the same thing here into the text, into the text file. Um, and then um, I've edited it so that this X, if you'll notice, turns into a solid circle. This means that the file has been modified, but it hasn't been saved yet. So there uh, are a couple of different ways to save the file. You can either come up to the file menu and um, go down to save file. Or you'll notice on this, it gives you what the shortcut key is. Um, for me, it's the, the Apple S. If I type Apple S, that saves it. You'll see there's a saving completed at the bottom and that dark circle turns to an X. So this means that the text file is now saved. So I'm gonna come back to the terminal and remind you of another, um, another command that you can use to look at the contents of text files. So cat, and then the name of the text file, which here is myscript.sh. This will also echo it to the screen. At the moment, it puts out what's inside of the text file and then kind of jams on my prompt right after it. And that's because there's no new line character here. So cat won't try and make this as pretty as it, it was here where the hello world got echoed without the, well, technically there, there was a return that I put in when they executed the command. But here it's, it's just jammed on because there's not an explicit character turn character here. But you can see, so this is indeed inside of this um, myscript.sh. And when we execute a command, so if I execute something like cat, cat is a program that exists somewhere inside of the operating system. Um, and so when I type cat and give it an argument and then execute it, the operating system has to know where to look for this particular program. Um, and, and then it, you know, internally, then it figures out what it needs to do to execute the command and it executes it. Um, at the moment, we can't simply type our, um, the name of our script and execute it just by typing the name. No, that doesn't work. <clears throat> Bash gives us an error. It tells us command not found. So there, there are a couple of things to know um, about executing things on, on the system. One is that Unix or Linux won't automatically um, try to look inside of your current directory for executables. Um, the executables on your system are, um, Linux determines how to look for them by an environment variable called path. Um, I'll, come to, I'll come back to that shortly. Um, we're gonna get a different error message if we're more explicit to, um, to the shell about where to look for this particular file. So right now, this is, this is like a shortcut for our relative path. You remember absolute and relative paths from before. Um, the absolute path would be specified all the way from the root directory. So right now we're in home Jovian um, and it re-entered the shell scripting and then we have the name of our file. Let's see, so it kind of gets wrapped around here. But um, if I execute this now, and it knows specifically where I'm trying to point it. So it doesn't say that the command is not found. But now what it's telling me is that the permission is denied. Um, so there's, there's something else besides the path that we have to worry about. Besides telling the shell where to look for commands, we have to, um, we have to specify that the particular thing that we're passing to it is indeed something that can be executed. 
So I didn't necessarily get around to talking about permissions explicitly before. Um, but if you do lists and then space dash L, th this will give you the, the more, more verbose listing of files where it tells you um, all the file or directory names. But there's also this information over here, which tells you the file and directory permissions. I mentioned this briefly before that the first character, the dash, if, if it's just a dash, this tells you that it's a regular file. If it's a D, it tells you it's a directory. So you can see where all the directories are. And then, then you have um, three sets of three letters, which can be either the R, W, X, or including the dash. The dash means that it's not, um, it's not permitted. And if you see the actual character, then that means it is permitted. So this is the script that we're interested in. These permissions are organized in terms of um, the three sets are for the for your, the user, which is you, and then the group, and then all users on the system, and then um, you have read, write, and execute. So at the moment, this is saying that there's um, you as the user have permission to read and write the file, but not to execute it. The people in your group, if there was a specific group that you're a part of, would only have permission to read it. And then all users on the system can read the file, but not write or execute it. So the reason it's complaining about permission denied is because we're trying to execute it, but we don't have permission to execute it. There's no X here. Um, we can change the permissions with the, with the command um, chmod for change the mode of the file. Um, and then there are a couple of different ways that you can change it. I usually change it by specifying um, this particular set of three in terms of uh, octal numerals. So, um, you know, with the, with the computer system, a lot of things are in base two. So this particular set of three, um, if you think of it in um, octal, the particular position for the X is, is your um, zero and one. And then for W, this is the two's place and this is the four's place. So you have four, two, and one. Um, a full set of all of them is gonna be one plus two plus four, which is seven. Um, if it's just an R, this would be four. If it was just an X, that would be two. Uh, if it's just an X, that would be one. And just a W would be two. So I'm gonna change this so that everybody on the system can execute it. Um, 755 is something that's common to set for executable permissions. So five is four plus one. So that's a read and execute. And you'll see when I change the mode of um, my script.sh to 755, um, now, now the executable is included in all of these. Um, I won't go into permissions more than this. You know, we just need 755 to set this as executable for ourselves and for other users. Um, if you're more interested in setting up permissions, I, I certainly invite you to read more about this, um, but I don't wanna to get too carried away with it. So now I'm gonna use the up, the up arrow as a reminder, it just cycles through the history of commands that you've typed. So if I type the up arrow, eventually I'll get back to where I specify the absolute path for my script. And now when I hit the enter key, now I do get the hello world. Um, because it's executable and I specify to the shell where it is that they, they can find it. Um, and when I execute the shell script, all that bash does is it goes into this file um, and it, it executes these commands as if they were regular commands that were typed at the terminal. And it'll just cycle through them if there are, say, multiple of them. I can also, by the way, ex execute this by specifying a relative path for my script.sh. So dot gives you your current working directory and then the slash to say that my script.sh is included in my, my current directory. So that's a, that's a shorter way to also execute something that's in your current directory. 
if if I actually want to um, execute um, the shell script without specifying um, either the absolute path or the fact this dot slash, it says the command is still not found when when I just type in this the shell script by itself. So now now we come back to the environment variables. Uh, environment variables are variables. We'll, we'll also come back to talking about variables themselves in shell scripts. So the, the idea is the same where you have some, some value that you want to um, refer to by some name, say. So I could, I could say, um, I'm going to make a, a variable called then, all caps, and put an equal sign and say, um, just assign it to a a string. This is my name. So right now, all of the variables that are inside of your environment can be, um, you can find them by specifying the dollar sign and then the name of the variable. So this is now an environment variable. And to look at the environment variables, print env will print all of the environment variables. So there, there are more here than I think you um, ever need to know about. Let's see, we'll scroll up here. What we're actually interested in is the one that I mentioned called path. So path is gonna be a long one here. This particular environment variable specifies all the directories in which the shell will look for executables. We can actually modify these environment variables. We want to be a little careful with path because you know we don't want to all, all of a sudden get rid of all of these and specify uh, just a random directory. But we can specify different values for these environment variables by saying that we're going to export um, the variable that we want to change, which is path. And then I'm going to say path. Well, the first thing that I want it to include is everything that already exists in this environment variable, which I've said is prefixed with a dollar sign. So I'm going to set path, this particular variable, to be equal to what's already inside of it, which is dollar path. And then each of these directories are separated by a colon. So I'm going to include a colon. And then I'm going to include the particular directory where I had my shell script. So in this case, this is home Jovian, and then it re intro to shell scripting. And then I'm going to hit enter. So if, if I echo just the path environment variable, you can see that now, now we have everything that was included in the path environment variable before, as well as the particular directory that we've added to it. So now when I type my script.sh, now, now it recognizes, it knows to look inside of our current directory, as well as all of these other directories when it's trying to find something to execute. And when it looks in this, this last directory, it finds, a shell script that we've written, my script.sh, and it is able to execute it then. All right. There's one final thing that I should mention, by the way, about shell scripts. Bash itself is, uh, is something on the system. So if we say which bash to show us where bash is located on the system, Bash is something that it thinks is executable. That's inside of the this user bin directory. Um, so what Bash does is Bash is so. For those of you, for example, who are familiar with Python, you can type Python space and then the name of the Python script that you want to execute, and Python is then the interpreter which knows how to execute all of those commands inside of the Python script. Bash here is essentially um, working like an interpreter to interpret all of the commands that are inside of this particular text file and then execute them as if they were commands to the bash shell. So I can type bash space and then the name of the script. And this is another way to execute the shell script. 
So really a good thing to do with all of your shell scripts is to explicitly tell um, the system what it is that you want to use as the interpreter, which here is um, this bash. Um, let me see. Yes, yeah, so that bash is located in two places. Bash here is located in user bin bash or it's located in bin bash. Um, either one function is um, similarly. How we specify this in our shell script is we put in two characters, two special characters, which collectively are called the shebang, um, which is easier than saying hash exclamation mark. Um, so the, the shebang, followed by the, um, the absolute path of the interpreter, will then tell the shell when you execute the shell script that you want it to use this particular interpreter when it's executing the shell script. Um, so this is a conventional nice something to see, uh, to, to include in your shell scripts. Yes, so I see there was a question in the chat. Thank you, Dave, for putting the print env to list the variables. Um, as far as the next question, is there a specific reason you'd want to make the file executable instead of just saying bash my script.sh? Um, not necessarily. I, I don't think, you know, I think. Um, kind of one of the overarching themes uh, or, or kind of uh, characteristics of good pro pro programmers is they're kind of productively lazy. Um, so they try and be kind of as lazy as possible, which means that they can really accomplish a lot with, you know, with doing as little as possible, so to speak. Um, so, so a lot of this is um, trying to find uh, the, the fastest way to do things, even if that means not typing a whole lot more characters than you need to. But really, there's no reason to, that you should can't type bash my script.sh rather than just typing this the shell script name by itself. Um, so I've included the, the shebang and the, the path for the interpreter. Um, another thing to know, by the way, is that any subsequent lines that are prefixed with the pound sign will be considered comments inside of your file. So I'll just say this is a, a file that says hello. Um, and then I'm going to save it again, which I'm going to be doing behind the scenes with the Apple S. And when I come back up here and I just say my script sh, it executes. Um, you know, the output is, hasn't been changed by anything that I've modified here inside of the shell script, but I've made it more explicit what the interpreter is and I've included a comment here, which is kind of a documentation for anybody. Com comments are good for anybody who comes to these shell scripts to orient them to what's going on. Um, in this case, I probably don't need the comment because this is so simple, but it's, it's useful to include comments for documentation. All right, so now let's make this, we're, we're now gonna start iterating on making this shell script a little more complicated. So say, say I don't wanna say hello world, I wanna say uh, hello to myself um, as a way for the computer to greet me. So I, I change world to my name. You can change it to your name you want, if you want, or you can just change this to something different. I save this and then I execute it again. So now, now it, it prints out hello Ben. Um, as a note, you can include um, carriage returns also inside of this string if you want. Um, I'm gonna include multiple things inside of this string. So I'm gonna write something which has my, say my name multiple times because I like hearing my name. So I'll say Ben, you have a nice name. Um, and then what, let's see, what else do I want? I'll just say, I'll say Linux commands that you type 
uh, or something that I consider denisms. Um, you know, that this is kind of really artificial and kind of cheesy, but um, this is to point out that, you know, it's not uncommon for you to say to, to want to reference something inside of your file multiple different times. Um, and say I was sharing this with you and you didn't want to have Ben in the shell script. You, you wanted to put your own name because you don't want the computer to call you Ben. So um, we come back now to the, the concept of variables. Um, I'm, I'm going to abstract this information so that it's easier to change just by changing it in one place in the file. And I'm going to say, I'm going to create a variable, my name. Um, my name is equal to Ben. And then um, in some sense, I already showed you how to reference environment variables with the dollar sign. Um, here you can reference um, variables that you've created inside of your shell script also with the dollar sign after you've created them. So I'm gonna change every instance of Ben um, to dollar sign my name. And just as a forewarning, we're gonna run into some conflicts here, but that's okay. So, um, all right, I'm gonna save this and execute it just to show you what happens. All right, so it, it shows me, hello, Ben. Uh, ben, you have a nice name. So, so it's, it's putting the variable value into where I've specified the, the dollar sign my name inside of the script. You'll see it kind of doesn't work on this last one. I say Linux commands that you type are something I consider. And then, then it doesn't know what this is. Uh, essentially, well, you, you can see it here because um, this particular window is doing syntax highlighting for the um, for the bash shell script. What it's doing is it's considering this entire thing as the variable name. Uh, after the dollar sign, it doesn't necessarily know where to stop. You know, in order to deter to determine what particular variable name you're referring to. So so it kind of goes to the end until it finds um, this this character, which is not allowed inside of the variable name. So you can also specify variable names more explicitly by um, putting curly braces around the variable name itself. So I have dollar sign curly and then curly braces around my name, which is the variable name. So when I save this and I execute it, now, now it does recognize that this thing is what I consider the variable and the, the isms is not part of the variable name. Um, you can see it, it works okay in this case because this is terminated by the, the exclamation point, which um, isn't considered part of the variable name here in the shell script. This is terminated by the comma. But if there are characters that are just jammed onto this, then I do need to specify it more explicitly with these curly braces. Um, one other thing to note about specifying the variable is that it's not okay here to put spaces around between the variable and the equal sign and the value. Um, if I save this with the spaces and execute it, um, it gives me, well, it's, it's printing out this stuff, but it, it hasn't actually assigned anything to this my name variable. And the first thing that it prints out is this. Um, so it's going to give you, you, you know, like if I scroll back up to where I had an uh, error message before, let's see, here, 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 for example, was an error message. So this said bash colon myscript.sh colon command not found. Um, this is telling me what was being executed. The, the bash shell just by itself um, was had an error when it was being executed. So bash was listed first here. Here it's um, myscript.sh is, is what's being executed. It gives you 
uh, location, which is line five, that's this one. And it tells you um, what it's complaining about my name, the command is not found. So remember that spaces in these Linux commands, um, the shell is gonna be very sensitive to them because normally the spaces separate, um, say arguments rather than, it, the shell isn't gonna consider this kind of thing one entity by itself. So when I type my name with a space, it thinks that I'm going to try and execute a command called my name. It's not going to recognize that I'm trying to do variable assignment. So that's um, that's the reason that you can't have any spaces here. And then um, if I get rid of this, um, you know, it, it still doesn't know how to interpret this. You have to have the value next to the equal sign, and you have to have the variable name against the equal sign without any spaces. Um, and that now it executes OK. Um, you also have to be careful about spaces when you um, say, I, I want a value that has different spaces. So I try and put both my first and my last name into this. Um, you know, it's going to give me it's going to give me a similar error because it's it's not going to think of this as one entity. It's going to think that this is a something, and then there's a space, and then this is another say argument or command or something. So in order to explicitly specify that this is what we want to assign to the my name variable, we have to um, surround it by quote marks. And that, that tells it explicitly that this is a string um, to assign to this variable. So I save this and now, now it, it doesn't complain and it prints out my first and last name. So I've talked about putting variables into scripts. What happens when we execute it is it prints out something to the to the terminal. You know, but if, if we're executing things, it's not necessarily all that common that we just want to print it out just for us to see once on the terminal. We might want to save it. We might want there to be some, you know, um, kind of subsequent action that takes place. So I didn't get around to talking about this last time, but there are different ways that you can control where the, the output gets sent inside of the shell. So um, a simple way, for example, to do this is to say, <clears throat> uh, is, is to use this um, greater than sign. So the, the greater than sign, you can kind of think of it like the tip of an arrow. And my script.sh space and then this, um, this greater than sign, and then you include another space. What this is going to do is it's going to redirect um, the output that my script.sh generates, and it's going to send it to a file. And if the file doesn't exist, it's going to create it. And by the way, if the file does exist, it's going to overwrite it. So I'm going to say output, um, just output from my script that txt for text. So when I do this and I execute it, um, so there's there's an output from my script.txt which appears here. So the file got created. Um, if, if I list the file that exists inside of the directory and I can look at the contents, just to remind you again with cat. So the, the file contents, if you want to double check just to be sure, you could actually double click on this file to open it, you know, and, and this will show you the contents of the file. And then click on the X if you want to close it. So the, the contents of this file um, are the output that was generated when you execute the script. Um, there's another way to do this, which is instead of including the single greater than sign, you can do a double one. 
And if you do the double one, um, that won't overwrite the file if it already exists. It just depends the output to the end. Um, so if I do it with a double one, and, and I look at what's inside of this, this is what was generated, actually these five lines here, were what was generated with the first shell script. And then the, these last five lines are what was generated when I executed this one. And I just appended the output to the file that already existed. So just to check that this is what's happening, if, if you only do one greater than sign, if I execute that again, it's gonna overwrite the file that exists. So when I cat the output, there's just gonna be one instance here. And just to be even more explicit, I'm gonna say my name is Benjamin. So I'm gonna save it in between doing the output. So that, that overrides it. And then if I say Benjamin John Winjum, and say I don't want to overwrite this, I want to keep the Benjamin Winjum, and then I want to write another output. I do the two greater than signs. And that now, now we have this from the first execution and this one from the second that was appended at the end. So now there's one more thing that I want to talk about with redirection. So I've, I've talked about redirecting the output. Um, another useful thing is not to just take the output and send it into a file to add it to a file, but sometimes we want to actually do operations on the output. So I had a command that I, I listed before, which was um, print env to print the environment variables. So print env, when you execute it, generates this long list, say, of environment variables. I'm gonna, I'm gonna um, just tell you another really short command, which is um, wc. wc will give you the word count of something. Actually, let me execute this first. Word count, say, of my script dot sh. Um, the first number that it gives you is the number of lines. Um, the second is the number of uh, the number of words, and then this is the number of bytes. I think that's correct. If you actually just give it a, a tag of dash l, um, it will tell you that there's it will tell you the number of lines. Let me come back up to this and say, I want to know how many lines are actually printed out when I do print DMV. There's a special character called the pipe, which is this vertical line. So on, on my character, on my keyboard, it's the character that's, I do shift and then the key that's directly above my return key to get the vertical line. This will give me the pipe. And so what it's gonna do is it's, it's gonna send the output from print env. If I just wanted to put the output into a file, I would use the greater than sign to say print env output dot text. Um, and the print env output then would be, you know, what's printed by print env. I can operate it on the output by using this pipe and then saying the command that I want to use to operate on the output. So if I do WCL, WC and dash L, normally I would give this a file name to specify the particular file that I want to say, find the number of lines in. Here I don't specify explicitly what the file name is because it's gonna take, um, it's gonna send the output from print env and use that as the input to this command. Um, which tells me that there's 104 lines in print DMV. I'm going to give you another example of this, which uses um, 
what you might find to be a very useful command like later on and if you work more with a shell which is grep um grep is a way to search for um a, a regular expression you don't have to necessarily worry about what a regular expression is but you can think of it as a way to search for something that's inside of a file so say i want to search for all the occurrences of my name inside of this particular script i would say grep space and then the particular sequence of characters which is what i want to search for and then the name of what it is that i want to search through and then it will print out all of the lines that have this my name in it so my name here is on on this line um there's this line and these these three lines inside of the string so if I do print and D and I want to search for something that's inside of print and D, say I want to search for path. This will show me all of the environment variables. Well, all of the lines inside of the specification for the environment variables, which have the characters capital P A T H. So here you can see that there's is not just path, but there's a Julio. Julia Depot path. Um, you can search for other things, say proxy, and it will print out everything that has the proxy. So grep can be a very useful way to search for things inside of your environment or actually inside of files. I use it a lot when I want to say search for for some kind of pattern that's inside of the file to see something where something is located. But I'm kind of digressing. The, um, the important thing here is the pipe command. So if I say my script.sh and I, I pipe it through WC, this is going to execute my script. But instead of printing the output to the terminal or printing it out into a file, it's going to send the output to this particular command. Um, and it's going to give the output as if I did WC on the output that was generated. So we kind of, um, let's see. You can do an, you can do this piping multiple times. You know, so say you didn't just want to look at word count for this, you wanted to do some kind of processing of the output that was generated. Um, here I'm going to make it a little more um, intuitive what's happening. So I've included the file here called animal data text inside of this inside of this particular text file. There are all of these lines. So, you know, one question that you might ask when you're looking at this is what animals are included in the lines of these five files uh, in the lines of this particular file say what unique animals are listed here um the first thing that we want to do is we just want to get the animal name from each file and then we're going to sort it so that we know um which lines are duplicated and then we can get rid of the duplicates so i've described a sequence of steps that we say we might want to take um, if I type it, you don't have to worry about what the cut command is per se, aside from the fact that this is what the syntax is going to be doing is it's going to be, um, taking what's input into it, using the comma as the separator character in order to break this up into uh, a list of values separated by commas. So the first. The, the dash F will tell you which particular um, item to, to extract. F1 would give you the first element. F2 is gonna give us the animal name after the column. So if I execute this, um, this takes this output, types it through the cut command, which is gonna cut this up into pieces based on the comma and only take the second one. And then I'm going to pipe this into something different, which is my, my third step, which is to sort these so that I know where the duplicates are. So there's, this, there's a command called sort. 
And actually, th this will sort it alphabetically. And then to the sort, then I'm, I'm going to pipe that output again to a different command called um, UNIQ, which um, deletes the, du the, the replicated lines. So here now, by piping, piping the output into successive Linux commands, I've arrived at some kind of processing of animal data dot text, which, which is what I specified, just to find the unique animals that are inside of this file. I don't expect it, you know, for you to remember these per se. Um, I'll actually show you at the very end of this class how you can save all of the commands that we've executed in this if, if you want to refer back to them later. Um, but the point here is that you can use the pipe multiple times if you want to do different processing on the output from one into the next. Let's see. So um, let's take um, a little breather from me talking and um, have you do something here yourself if you'd like. So I've included um, some exercise directories here. Um, so change directories into exercise one. And inside of this directory, I've included a readme. So if, if you look at the contents with cat, uh, I've, I've given you some directions here for an exercise. So, well, I'll, I'll read them out here. So the history command prints the past commands you've executed, tail dash n with a number as the argument and then the file, file name as an argument will print the last say number of lines of the file that you've specified. So try and use the, the pipe command to make a single line command that will save the last five commands of your history into a file called last5.txt. So I'll give you a minute here to try and try and do that. Um, and feel free to jump in if you have questions. And by the way, if you get through it early, try making a, a shell script that includes this command and execute the shell script to do it. Unfortunately, I can't see everybody, so I don't know at what stage everyone is, but um, I'll jump in here and tell you how I would tackle this. So um, history command, the history, if you just type history and hit enter, this will tell you, that this, this shows you all of the commands um, that you've ex executed. And then I want to pipe it. I want to look at only the last five. I don't have to specify a, a file name here when I'm piping it because it takes as input to this the output of the history command. Um, and then from this, I want to output it to a file. 
Let's see, I've forgotten the last five. Let me just do a right last five dot text. So I use the greater than symbol to output what's generated here in the second step into the file last five dot text. So then last five dot text contains the last five file dot five commands that I've executed, including by the way you might note the one that I just executed here when I was in the process of generating last5.txt. And the, the reason it writes, it records the command that I've executed in the history before it, the shell even executes it. Um, and it does that just because, you know, you might want to, if something catastrophic happens and this command doesn't end up working, it's still saved into the history as something that you've tried to execute. If I want to make a shell script with this, so I could make a text file. I'll just keep it, uh, let's see, I'll rename it. Uh, inside of exercise one. That's five, that shell. And I could simply copy this command into the shell script. And you'll note, I, I won't be able to execute this because the, of the permission tonight. So I have to change the mode to 755, the last five that shell. And then I can execute it and it will, uh, well, let me remove this just so you see that it's actually generated. So there's no text file here, whereas when I execute the script, now, now it does the last five that text. So to the question, tail doesn't require files or parameter and defaults to what's recorded via pipe if you don't specify one. Um, tail will require file if you only execute that tail command by itself. But if if it's included after a pipe symbol, then you don't have to include the file. Yeah. And it goes this. And then there's um, let's go into exercise the exercise two directory as well. So I mentioned grep. This is just kind of a refresher of what I did before. So I was maybe going through that relatively quickly. This is to remind you that grep is an extremely useful command to, to search for regular expressions where you can do grep and then the thing you wanna search for and then the file name or set of files you wanna search for. So use grep and pipe like I was doing before to try and replicate my command to print all of the envir environment variables that contain proxy. And then when you do that, try and order them alphabetically. Just to remind you to order them, you can use the sort command.
All right, so I'll assume that most people have had time. So print env will print your environment variables. If I type that up but, and search for proxy, then um, you want grep the regular expression, which is the sequence of characters that I want to search in the output. So print env pipe to grep proxy will print every environment variable that has the proxy. And then to sort them, then I pipe the output again to sort. And this will print them alphabetically. Uh, with this command. All right, are there any questions um, about what I've been discussing? Let's jump into something now a little more complicated. So I'm going to close this myscript.sh file. And I'm going to come back here into my um, every enter the shell scripting directory. And I'm going to create a new, a new script. So I click on the plus to create a new file, click on text file. And then I drag this to the bottom in my case to um, tile the windows. And I'm going to rename it. Um, a butterfly that shell. So what we're actually going to be doing with this shell script, by the way, is generating a plot that looks like a butterfly, which um, you know you might find it interesting to look this up later. When people were um, starting to look at um, chaotic systems um, and looking at strange attractors, they came across this plot. Um, which, which looks like the butterfly, which is where um, kind of the locus of points in space that the dynamics are attracted to um, flip back and forth between two points, which is why it looks like a butterfly. So it's um, kind of oscillations around two points in space, which look like the wings. Well, I'll show an example when we execute the script. So I'm gonna change directories back into the IDRI into the shell script directory. Um, inside of the script, we're going to put the shebang for bin bash as our interpreter. We're going to put a comment just, um, this will use Python to generate some butterfly plots. You know, at this point, you can just put anything you want for the comment here. Um, but we do have to be more specific about the particular command that we execute. So the commands that we put in here don't just have to be uh, Linux commands. <clears throat> they, they can be, say, from applications that are installed on the system, or you can execute others, other shell scripts that you've um, designed and that you've put into your path. Here, I'm, I'm going to execute um, the Python interpreter. I'm going to put a space and then um, the name of the Python script. But I've already included this for you. I'll open it. You, you don't necessarily have to open this yourself, but just to show you what it is. Um, it's Python code, um, you know, which essentially numerically solves a differential equation and then plots the result. And it's going to save it, save a figure file as a PNG. This is just to specify the name of the file based on variables that are passed into it. So there are certain mathematical parameters that are specified in here, which get passed in as uh, arguments when you call the call the Python command and execute the script. So there has to be a variable for sigma rho and beta. It, this is just by way to orient you to what I'm going to type here in the command. So um, I need I need three numbers here when I execute this. Um, so 10, 28, and 2.67 end up being good variables to use to generate the butterfly plot. Um, 
we'll change change these shortly and kind of cycle over different ones to see what different ones produce. But for the moment, this is going to be our shell script. So I save it. And when I execute it, I can just type the name of the script by itself because this directory is in our path. Butterfly.sh, you know, it's going to tell me the permission is denied because I've created a new text file, but I haven't given it the executable permission. So I change mode to 755. By the way, if you don't want any other users to be able to execute this, um, you can execute change mode and then 700. The 00 says that the groups and other users beside yourself won't have any permissions to do anything with the file. So 700 is another common set of permissions. The zero, if you don't want anybody else to be able to execute this. But when I um, let's see. So when I execute this now, it just it doesn't output anything to the screen, the terminal screen per se, but it it will generate a file here that you see inside of your directory. So um, it's called fig and then dash and then what it's going to output is the variable values for sigma rho and beta. But if I double click on it to open it. You'll see this plot here, which looks like the butterfly. So this butterfly plot is generated when we execute the Python script butterfly.py with these particular parameters. All right, so that's kind of nifty. And let's say that we don't necessarily want to only generate one plot. You know, we want to see how the plot varies as you vary some of these parameters. So similar to what syntax you might want to do inside of um, programming scripts or um, programs that you design with programming languages, you want to control the flow of your program and do, say, execute this particular command for multiple different values of sigma, which is this first variable 10. I'm going to make this um, a little easier to read. So I'm going to explicitly say that sigma, say, has a value, that rho has a value. What's rho? Sorry, Joe. And that beta has a value. And here, instead of the 10.28 and 2.67, I'm going to reference the variables with the dollar sign and the variable name, sigma, rho, and beta. I'll, I'll save this again and just make sure that it runs OK. Um, it actually just regenerates this bigger plot, but it, it doesn't give any error messages. So now as our first flow control thing that we're going to talk about, we're going to talk about a for loop. So say, say I want to I want to make the plot for values of sigma that are 5, 10, 15, and 20. The basic syntax for a for a for loop is to say for and then the variable you want to iterate over, which is just a dummy variable. And then you just specify values that are separated by spaces. There, there are other ways to do this, which we'll talk about, but this is this is an easy way. So you just say for a variable in some list of values, um, and then do, and then you put the command that you want to do, which for us is this one. So I'm, I'm just going to copy this there. And I'm going to comment this out so that it's not explicitly executed. The only Python script that executed is here in this loop. And then at the end, you have to put done. All right. So here's, here's our for loop. 
and I'm going to save it and I'm going to execute this again. So it finished. Uh, it takes a little bit of time to update this on the left, but you can click this little circular arrow thing. Um, you'll see it, it didn't actually do anything. <laughs> and the reason is because I made a mistake when I was writing this. You'll see there isn't actually anything in here which depends on this variable i. Um, I mentioned that I want to make sigma different values, but I still included just the variable sigma, which is always set equal to 10. So what I actually have to do is I have to include this as a variable inside of here. And I refer to the variable just the same way with the dollar sign. So dollar sign I will substitute these values in into here every time I execute the script. But now, now when I execute this, this is going to generate um, four, four different figure files here. So let's look at the one that's 20. Um, so you'll see definitely that the butterfly pot has changed. Now it's um, kind of started out here and it circled around, but then it got attracted to this point over here and spiraled down. All right. It, it would be nice if it actually told us here what it, what step it was on. So you can include multiple comments here inside of the loop. Um, just as long as they're in between the do and the done. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna execute um, value of say I has now been used and save it. So, so now every time it cycles through this, it's gonna execute the script and then it's gonna say, okay, that value has now been used. It's, it's just so we know where it is when it's executing. Um, this is kind of the for loop in a nutshell. Um, just to solidify some of these, let's look at the, um, the files inside of the XR3 directory. So I've included XR3.sh. whose contents, let me look at this actually inside of, uh, inside of here. So I have two different for loops here. Um, one of which is this one and one of which is this one. So try going into that directory and comment one of them out and run it and then uncomment that and comment the other one out and run it. And um, see if you understand the difference between what's being output. So I'll, I'll give you a minute here just to do that. All right, let me show you what happens here.
So in the first case, the for loop over it uh, iterates over everything in in this particular directory, which has a dot txt as the suffix. The asterisk as a reminder is um, a wildcard which specifies um, zero or any number of characters before this dot txt. And then what it does is it lists, and then this lists um, everything with the same wildcard, this star.txt. And you can see it's the same thing like what I did here where I didn't change the sigma to the i. Um, here it's, it's listing all of the files that have the .txt extension every time it iterates over this loop. So basically what this does is it acts like a counter, essentially, because there are, there are three files in here in, inside of the directory. So it, it prints out all of the files um, three times. Now, if, if I uncomment this one, or I comment that one and I uncomment this one, um, now we get what might be the intended thing, which is where we actually explicitly include um, the iteration variable inside of this. And we only list um, the particular file that's in this list that we're iterating over. So it, it uses this wildcard to expand, um, expand this. Um, and then for each of these files, it, it lists it. Yes, there's, uh, let's see. There's a question in the comments about the, about coming late. Um, let's see if I can type this here really quickly. Um, let's see, there's a capital H there. I don't think that matters, but that's, that's the link to the materials. And then on, inside of that page that you get to, there's a link at the bottom to log into either the Jupyter Hub or the Binder Hub to access this environment I'm showing. Um, right. Uh, so as another example of the for loops, um, does solidify our understanding, go into the exercise four directory. So now I've included another shell script here. Um, so as I've noted, you'll get an error when you run this script. Um, so the question is why, and then improve the script so the error doesn't occur. Um, so that's the first thing that you want to do. And then the second thing is that, um, as you might note, only a subset of results will be written to all that text, whereas um, likely the script was written in order to write all of the contents to all that text. So try and modify the script so that um, all of what gets iterated over gets written to all that text.
Okay, so let me come back and um, the first one, you'll get an error running this Y and improve the script. So let me run it. Um, so it complains about my second and file.txt, which um, I mentioned this before. So there's there's a file name here which has spaces inside of it, which if you try and pass it in as an argument without explicitly saying that this entire thing is the is a string that's the name of the file, you'll get into trouble because the bash shell will try and interpret each of these as um, different, say, arguments to a command. So what we need to do in here is we need to make sure that everything that is being iterated over inside of this loop is considered its own unique um, string. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to put this dash f inside of quote marks so that it's considered to be a single string when it gets iterated over. Um, so now when I execute it, I don't get the, the error. Um, and just by the way, to, to show you that it's actually doing everything, just to echo the, the F. All right, so th this, is, this is what it's iterating over. Um, you can see, by the way, now all that text pops up. So let me look at what's inside of all that text. Um, you know, a tongue in cheek joke for those of you who are familiar with DNS. But it's a. Uh, um, this is the contents of uh, the the third file, the the third dot text. But there are other contents to say test.txt is here is my first line, um, my second file, here is file number two. None of those get put into all that text. And the reason none of them are put in is because this is the single caret. So if you remember the single versus the double or not caret, I guess the greater than symbol. The, if it's just a single greater than symbol, it overwrites this file if it exists. So if you don't want to overwrite it, if you just want to append what's being output here into the file, you can use the double care, the double greater than. And the double greater than will append the contents to, to the file that you specify. So now when I do exercise four, well, the first thing it's going to complain about is that I'm confusing the inputs and the output files because all that text already exists and it's trying to write it to itself. So that, that's the reason for this first error, which we could get rid of just by removing all that text and re-executing. And now what's inside of all that text is the contents of each of these three files that are iterated over. All right. Um, there are different ways to specify what you iterate over besides just explicitly listing everything here. Um, let me, um, let's see. One thing that we can do, by the way, is to, <clears throat> well, let, let, me, let me do seek first. So you can generate a sequence of of numbers using the seq command. seq and then the start number and the end number will generate a sequence of numbers that are separated by an integer step of one between your start and your end numbers. Um, the syntax of including the increment is just that the increment has to go in the middle. So we have a start of five, we have an end of 20, and we have an increment of five, which gets put as the second number. So start increment and end, we can have start increment and uh, the start with the increments then of five to the end number, which is 20. That's a useful command, but now we have to face the issue of how do you put 
shell commands into other shell commands. So this, this thing by itself is something that you could type on the terminal prompt. You know, but you have to worry about um, putting in a whole separate command with its own arguments here if you want to include uh, a separate shell whose output gets used as this list of numbers here. So there, there are um, there are several ways actually to put in something that gets uh, interpreted inside of this shell command. One is to use the dollar sign and the parentheses. Uh, I'm sorry, dollar sign, yeah, dollar sign and parentheses. So um, here we could put in the sequence five, five, and twenty. And when we execute this, the shells, the bash shell will, will know when it's interpreting this that it will execute this as its own kind of subcommand, which um, will generate output, which gets substituted in here for this command. So the sequence 5520 will generate this as the output, and then that output will be used as the list here. So you have to change directories back. So when I execute this now, butterfly uh, better. Um, it's iterating now over 5, 10, 15, and 20. So that looks good. Another way, this is probably a little more modern way, the, the older way is to put um, backticks around this. So if you put backticks around this, it also considers it as a shell command that has to, um, whose output gets substituted here. So you can use the backticks or you can use the dollar sign and then close it with parentheses. Um, if you actually wanted to do something which is, there's an additional way actually to do this as well with something which is more like a C++ syntax where, um, I'll kind of skip over that for now, but you can include something which is like, um, your start value, your conditional, and then your increment separate, separated by semicolons. Uh, let me just see here. Well, I hope I don't get the syntax wrong, but this would just be like um, i equals 5, i less than equal 20, and i plus equal 5. So this is the C-like syntax, where um, you in include the C-like syntax inside of these double parentheses. So th that's another way if you want to do the, the increments like this for the for loop. I'm going to change this back to I for I and say um, You don't just have to specify all of your parameters inside of the shell script. You say that you just want to make this executable where you can explicitly tell the shell script on the from the command line what values it is that you want to use. Um, there, there are special variables that you can use. So dollar sign one will pass in the first parameter that you give it on, on the command line. So if, if I say butterfly shell dot sh and now put in the parameter as my the argument that gets passed into this, dollar one is the way to reference this five that gets passed in. Oh, I didn't save it. <laughs> All right, so it only executes it for five. Um, but say I really want to do 5, 10, 15, 20, 25. If I can't pass in, you know, more here, there are a couple of ways to pass in multiple arguments into the file. One is just to explicitly say um, that each of these is its own argument that gets passed in and you use dollar, and then you just start incrementing the numbers to get successive arguments that are being passed in. 
Actually, let me only do three here. So it's not going to complain if you give it more arguments than you have variables for, just because it gets to the end and it, it doesn't actually reference dollar sign four and dollar sign five. I can include those. So now it iterates over 5, 10, 15, 20, and 25. If you don't want to put the dollar sign with, with each of these individually, you can use dollar sign and at to grab everything from the all of the parameters that have been passed in here. So this now will also iterate over all of them. Or if you feel like being lazy on the script side and just including dollar one, you can actually pass this in as a string. So now this entire thing will be considered as your first argument. And that's that's another way to iterate over all of them. All right, so we've we've come to the end of what I'll talk about with the four. Um, a, another key key thing to use is um, an if conditional. So you might only want to do certain commands conditioned on the truth or falsity of a, a condition. So say I don't want to print out the value of um, such and such has been, now been used every single time. I only want to do it, um, you know, every five, uh, not every five, every 10. The basic syntax for, for an if is um, you have if condition. Um, say then, um, then your command. And then, then you terminate it with the fi. So instead of do and done, you have an if and then the if reversed. But there's something else I want to mention here too. So you might see this um, variously referenced as four and then do on the separate line or four and do on the same line. If you separate this with the colon, if you include the do on the same line, you have to separate it with the colon. And the same for the if and the conditional. And the, the if and the conditional, this also has the else if condition um, command, as well as the else command. But we still have to terminate it with the inverse if. So there's there's something else here that we have to discuss, which is how how do you specify a condition for bash? There are actually um, two ways to specify. Well, a number of ways to test the truth and falsity of the condition. So there's um, if you want to test the condition. There's just a test command. So you can test an expression. Or um, that's this is one way to do it. And the second way is just to include it between brackets. And you have to include um, spaces between the bracket and what it is that you're evaluating inside of it. The expression can't come up a neighbor against the brackets. So let me show some of this to you just on the command line. So um, I'll use it with an if condition. So let's see. The files that we have in here are, um, we have animal data.txt, which is a, a regular file. And we have um, xr5, which is a directory. So if test, and I'm gonna pass in the dash F, which just tests if the file name that I put after it, which here is animal data.txt, it tests whether it's a regular file or something else. So this is gonna evaluate to true. Then I say, um, then echo. Then 
I put the fi at the end. So if this condition, which is testing the testing whether animal data is actually a regular file, if that evaluates to true, then it echoes this. Um, and dash f is for regular file, dash d is for directory. So if it's dash d, animal data dot text is not a directory, so it doesn't print this. This is one way to write the condition. You'll also see the condition written as with the brackets. If it's with the brackets, you don't need the test. Um, and by the way, you don't just have, you probably will sometimes see single brackets, sometimes you might see double brackets. If I put the double brackets here, it still evaluates this as the condition. Um, the double brackets are a more modern notation, which actually allows you to test for some things related to wildcard expansions and regular expressions in here. Um, we're getting close enough to the end that I don't want to delve into that, but it might be worth looking up later, you know, if you want to see the differences between the single and double brackets. Um, you know, you might want to look that up later yourself. But here, here we have different ways to test, test the condition. Um, this is just a regular if. I'm going to go back to the single brackets. And just say then echo echo yay else say echo two. we can put in the the else the if the then and the else and you'll see there's there's a semicolon here to separate this if you type these conditions or this is also true for command line um entries of the four say i wanted to execute this one on the command line I would have to include the semicolon here before the do, but then, then there would be nothing separating this from the do. But then, then I, it's you know kind of funny. Let me do this. Just so you see the semicolon is actually up here. It's, it's a noting that you've come to the end of this particular command. Then I can put this command after the semicolon to tell it's the second command inside of the for loop. And then you have to explicitly specify that it's done with the done. So the done terminates the for loop, the fi terminates the if. When I execute this, um, here I have to say that it's not colon one, I'll just say for i and five and 10. So, yeah, well, so I've, you know, since I've just copied and pasted, I've actually included variables in here which aren't explicitly specified as environment variables. Let me change those quickly here. So row we said before was 28 and beta was 2.67. So it iterates over five and 10. It executes this as the first step of the loop executes this as the second part of the loop and then continues iterating through it but it's it's certainly easier to understand it inside of the shell script form than inside of the, just typing it all at once inside of the terminal um let's see all right, so, so I've talked about the basic syntax for if, and I mentioned maybe what we want to do here is inside of the for loop, we only want to print this every 10. Um, so I'll talk about one more thing, which is how to evaluate arithmetic expressions. Because to, we, need, we need to know that, the, um, say, the value mod mod 10, whether that's equal or not to zero. So I'll just say if um, let's see how do I want to say this? If so this might look a little funny at first. Right. 
Oh, let me just execute it so you can see what happens. Nothing. Let's see. I think it's looking for an argument for the four loop. Oh, yes, thank you. Yes, and did that as well as thing. So I got myself turned around. There's there's this the dollar sign one. Yes, never said that. Thank you. Um, which means it has to be. Let me pass this in with more than more than just five and ten. So the the dollar one here isn't specified inside of this, which is so it had to be specified here on the command line. And now you can see it goes through the for loop. Um, the syntax here, when if you you can actually do this at the command line. So if you want to evaluate arithmetic expressions, um, you do it with a dollar sign and the, the double parentheses. So say um, five plus 100, whatever this is. Right. So th this will get evaluated, but it, the bash shell is just giving me an error that the sum what this evaluates to which is the sum is not the command so it can't execute it so i'm, I'm just going to execute what this actually produces so this arithmetically evaluates the sum now you can only do integer arithmetic inside of the bash shell uh, the shell isn't really developed to do you know fancy arithmetic and there are certainly other programming languages you know which are much better for doing some of these loops and fancier fancier maths um, but you will occasionally have to have something like this where you might want to do so evaluate some arithmetic expression what this is the arithmetic expression that's getting evaluated and it's inside of this it's taking the current iteration value which is dollar sign i and it's it's taking the modulus with 10 which just means um for every of these that's evenly divisible by 10 then it's going to echo this particular string i hope that's not too confusing um the basic point is that i'm using an if i'm using this as the test condition when this evaluates to true then this command gets executed and then I, I terminate the if with the fi. Um, something similar is just say, I just want to execute this one, um, i is equal to 10. So it executes all of the steps, but only echoes this when the iteration value is 10. All right, so we're getting close to the end. I have just one, um, let me, see. I'm gonna skip over the fifth exercise and just show you um, this final thing. So I've included this folder called butterfly underscore PDF, um, which is gonna start and get us to something that's, you know, hopefully that you start to understand what's going on here, but it's certainly more complex. So if you look at this file, I've included the interpreter, I've included comments about what it does, and I've interspersed these comments throughout it so that it specifies what's happening. Um, here I've specified values for variables, the row and the beta that are gonna get passed into the Python script. Um, this in is included every time just so it removes initial data that exists. But the idea is that it's going to use, um, it's going to try and get some initial data for sigma based on content that's inside of animal data. It's going to get that initial data. It's going to use that data to, as an input parameter for the butterfly Python script. 
then once it's generated the figures, it's going to generate a HTML file, which you can visualize on the web page, or a PDF document, which will um, contain the figures that have been generated by the Python script. So the first getting the data is this, um, which you can sort through this later. You know, I'm not sure if this is going to make sense to you since I'm probably throwing a lot of content at you, but this is a for loop. Um, um, for what this does is for every line in animal data dot text. So I include the back ticks to notify this that this is a shell command whose output has to get put in here and substituted for this. So for every line, um, it it echoes the line and it pipes it into the, the word count. WC-M will get all of the, the characters actually. So the, the number of characters in each line of this will get put into this init data.txt. And then it's gonna get passed into this my nums, which is gonna be used for the iteration variable to make the plots. So it's gonna, it's gonna sort the numbers and only take the unique numbers. So if there are duplicates, it's not gonna duplicate the efforts. I'll execute this in just a moment to show you the result. But then once it gets the, you, for it, you have an array of values, which are the, numbers of characters for each of the lines that are in animal data.txt. It uses those as the values for sigma. It's going to tell you it's made the plot. And then here I'm I'm echoing what you need to create an HTML page. This is a string, which is the header for the HTML page. It outputs that into a file called myimages.html. It iterates over all of the figure files that are inside of the directory now. And for each of those, it um, writes another string back into this myimages.html, but it depends it. So you have the double greater than sign. Um, these backslashes are so that you can escape the quote marks inside of this thing, which is delimited by quote marks. But it's a, it's a way of, of using each of these bigger files as an image inside of the HTML code. And then you write, um, write the final closing tags for the HTML file. And then you, um, this is an application which will convert the HTML document into a PDF document, myimages.pdf. So I went over that relatively quickly, but hopefully this is starting to make at least a little sense. Um, let me navigate into butterfly PDF. So when we run it, it's initially going to complain. We had the remove, that remove since the file didn't exist, it just told us it didn't exist. Then it made the pot, the 15, 16, 18, and 19, are the unique numbers of characters for the lines in this file. So use those as the values for sigma. It made the figure files by executing the Python command. And now we have, well, you can see it over here too. We have the HTML file and we have the PDF document. So I'm gonna open this in a new browser tab. Um, the Jupyter Lab, maybe this is going to be finicky too. Oh, it's going to, oh, no, I shouldn't close that. Yeah. So here now we have a PDF document, which has this particular plot for value of 15, 16, 18, and 19. And if, um, the HTML file probably won't be as easy to render because it's, um, I think there are, there are issues, you know, with trying to, trying, trying to show figures or allow HTML pages to do things outside of the Jupyter lab because of security issues. But you can download, if you download myimages.html to your local computer by, um, so I'm kind of right-clicking on this, 
you can do download here, or you can probably go up to here, file, and um, let's see. So it won't let you download it there. But if, if you right click on it, you'll be able to download it. And then you have to download the figure files as well. Let me, let me do this so you can see it. And now let's see if I can open this in the same browser tab. So here now is the web page we generated with, with the figures inside of it. And as the final thing, I'll just remind you that you can use history to look at all of the past commands that you've had. If you want to save this so you can refer back to it later, if you've been following along with some of this um, history and then the greater sign and then say, let me go back up the directory to into the shell scripting. My class commands that text. If I do that, then they will save all of the commands that I've executed during this class into this particular text file. At least I think the last 500 or so. Um, yeah, so I, I hope this has been useful and that it's given you a better idea of shell scripting. I'm going to stop the recording now and um, I'm happy to stay around for questions too, if you have them.